Uh, well, first of all, congratulations for your new album. I I really Thank loved you. it. And uh, the, since the beginning, since I put the album and I started listening, the first thing that caught my attention was like the production, the mixing. I mean, I find it it's so organic. You can hear all the details, all the guitars, the, the arrangements. Yeah, you know, uh, our guy Alan does a good job mixing. Uh, Eric Bollinger mastered it. You know, we uh, it's it's a good team. Uh, Josh Josh did a good job. It's a good team he put together. Yeah, that uh, yeah, that's great. And I was wondering, how did you guys uh, record the album? Uh, because I guess that you all played live in the uh, I, I don't know if in the same room or the, uh, how, how was we did eight songs. We did eight songs in three days, four days at Sunset Sound. Mm -hmm. In Los Angeles, and then we did the last three in Nashville. All the strings and horns were cut in Nashville, and uh, that was it. The whole record took six days, seven days. Wow! And and the process of composition and arrangement also, or it was yeah. prior? we did a day of pre-production. We just went through everything. You know, once you get in there, they kind of play themselves. You know, once you pick the, you got to pick a key. And then you pick the key, you, you pick the, uh, you know, you just pick a, you know, the arrangement. Some of the stuff you're like, okay, let's take a long solo, short solo. It's not, it's not hard once you get in there, especially with that band. The band is like so good. Yeah, actually talking about the band, I was, I was, uh, another thing that got my attention is the, in the song, Hope You Realize It, like the bass line from Calvin Turner is like, pfft. yeah. Well, we 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 had a discussion about that. It's like, are we going to go full tower of power? Like, probably should. You know, let's not not kid ourselves where that inspiration came from. Um. So yeah, I mean, it's uh, you know, it's it. Calvin's great. You know, he played bass in the whole thing. Kirk Fletcher played guitar in the whole thing. Josh played on the whole thing. I played on the whole thing. So we weren't lacking skills. On this, so it was, it was a. I mean, Lamar and Reese and Jeff Babco. Uh, uh, it's, it was really good. Yeah, actually, I was going to ask you about uh, Joseph Smith and Kate Fletcher. Uh, first, uh, for, for Joseph Smith, I, I I wanted to ask you how important is him for you, like as a producer, and he also is like a killing guitarist. So, well, you know, I asked Josh to do it because we talked about what it would sound like. And Josh and I had this very clear vision um, about what we wanted to do with Blues Deluxe Volume 2. And, and we've had some uh, experience producing other records like this for other people, like Joanne Shaw Taylor and Joanna Connor. Um, we did a, you know, uh, did a did a record with Mark Broussard the same way. Um, we did, there was a lot, you know, there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of, um, you know, we have experience in this this world you know the same band you know and uh so yeah it, it it all it really took was as long as it took to get the solo right you know we took everything was pretty much on the floor as we played it okay we like this tape we're done sing it move on so it's like old school yeah and also uh, for, for me it's very interesting because uh Nowadays, uh, there's many bands that they only have one guitarist or two guitarists, and you you have two rhythm guitarists one that they play lead sometimes. So the more guitarists, the more complex is fitting in. So, but so why why you you know? Well, I mean, everybody knows what they're doing. You know, I mean, it's like okay, we, it's like when Josh and I play on other people's records together. It's like okay, what role do you? I'll, I'll, I'll you you take the Telecaster role. I'll take the lo-fi arch top thing, or vice versa. Uh, you know what I mean? And and it, it, we, you know, everybody knows how to fit in and there's no, you know, there's no egos. That's, that's the cool thing about it is like, there's really no egos. It's like, who cares who plays what, well, you know, you know, this, this happened to be my record. So I, I was stuck doing all the solos and the singing, but that's kind of what you need. You know, it's a solo record. You, it's what, mm -hmm. it's what you do. So, yeah, I mean, it was, it, the process was pretty straightforward. It wasn't, wasn't overly complex. You, you can get in trouble by overthinking shit. Yeah, and when you when you get to hang out with them, do you guys uh, share leagues, uh, learn from one each other? Yeah, I steal stuff from everybody equally. 
<laughs> I don't know if they steal from me, but I'm stealing from them. I'm sure for they sure. do. <laughs> for sure. Okay, and and this you're celebrating the 20 years from your first blues deluxe album, and for what I read in, in interviews uh, from you, um, I think that kind of was like a changing point in your career, right? That album. Yeah, it was the first album that I think people started to take notice, and I think it was also the first album that I just did what, what the fuck I wanted. You know, um, there was no A and R, there was nobody going. We need a radio hit. It's like. This was the last shot. That was 20 years ago. It was the last shot for me. You know, I was 25, you know, looking looking down the barrel of extinction. Um, but to be honest with you, you know, when your back is against a brick wall, you have no other option to, other than to move forward. So that's 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 what I did. So and then, you know, people in Europe, Spain, everyone started to take notice first overseas and then i i would be able to come back and tour america and more people would show up and uh so yeah it was uh it was the beginning of the hardest 20 fucking years of my life but here i am you know nine times platinum and whatever yeah. Yeah, that's great, and and I love you. Pay tribute to your to your you know your influences, your your idols. Uh, it was a little bit surprising for me. Well, not surprising, but uh, I kind of like it that there's a apart from blues, there's a lot of R and B, soul, Motown sound in this in this album. So it's a little bit of everything. I mean, you know, I mean, my journey to the blues was through London, not through Mississippi or Chicago. So I had to pay tribute to my English brethren to make sure that that was um you know doable you know it's like so there's a little nod to london there's a little nod to soul there's a little nod to the like groovier bass stuff you know my singing idols like bb uh, king and and uh bobby bland um you know there's you know some odd covers guitar slim Uh, we did we did a Bobby Parker song, which was really cool. Bobby was a friend, late great Bobby Parker. I, I'm I'm just sad that he didn't he wasn't alive to hear it, but you know he would have. He, be, it's the second Bobby Parker song I've covered, and uh, it's uh, you know I mean the, the the record itself is I think is strong, you know, just yeah. from start to finish, and it was it, it didn't take a lot. It was just good players with well thought out songs, decent arrangements and go in and execute it it was just it was that simple I, i don't think we were in the studio for more than four or five hours a day you know i, I we work from like 11 to like five maybe you know and then i i quit i, I don't like i don't like working late <laughs> but the result is is awesome and and also the two original songs your song and george's last song i, I love that song there's like some melodic guitar in in there is it Yeah, that I mean, I, I when Josh brought the song, I said, "Well, this is really cool, but we need to, we should, we should do a real Gary Moore kind of treatment to it, like a still got the blues, uh -huh. you know, because without Gary and guys like Walter Trout, you know, the the blues rock in Europe would would look a lot different. You know, they paved the way for people like me to come in 20 years after the fact, you know, because because uh, Gary and Walter were out doing this shit in the 80s and 90s." And you know, I didn't really get started to like the early 2000s. Yeah, you know, I got actually I got to interview Walter uh, a few months ago, and one one said he told me uh, he told me that with with the pass of time and the years, he tries to play less notes every day. And yeah, I find that in your album, you also play very melodic and not so like all these run stuff that you can do. So I think you are on the same line. Well, Walter made a T-shirt. Do you remember that the, the old Walter Trout T-shirt says "Too loud, too many notes"? Ah, uh, no, I just remember that his yeah. album "No More Free Jokes" that I have it in, but no, I don't remember the T-shirt. Yeah, I mean, and and seriously, I mean, as you get older, it's like, and you have a 35, 40 year career, and you, I've done almost 50 albums in my life. It's like, what the fuck do I got to prove? You know what I mean? It's like I, I'm not, I, I don't need to blaze over everything. I've I've done that, you know, and. You, you you know you you floor it every once in a while, but you don't have to go crazy, you know. That's that's what you learn with maturity. No, and you don't have to prove anything. Uh, actually, one of the questions I I wanted uh, to ask you 
is that I, I think that uh, yourself and probably John Mayer are the two most iconic figures that are are making the blues come back and that so many young guitarists start playing blues again. So, well, that's, you know, everybody, everybody has a gateway to it. You know, I mean, mine was Clapton and John Mayer on the Blues Breakers and Rory Gallagher, Gary Moore. You know, those were those are my guys that was like, oh, I want to do that. You know, so now that I'm in my late 40s or getting to my late 40s, I'm starting to see young people like in their 20s going, I, I, I discovered the blues through the ballad of John Henry. I'm like, shit, that really? What the hell will you? You know, so you start seeing that more and more. And, uh, you know, I'm I'm, I'm, I'm honored by it, that. It, it's a it's a it's a real pleasure to see that happening in real time, you know. Um, cause you lose track of time. You know, I made a, I wrote, wrote a whole album about that, about how just, just blink an eye. It's like, geez, it's been, it's been, it's been a lot. A lot yeah, of work. Actually, yeah. Actually, I'm sure that uh, in 20 years from here now, some guy that is going to break it and be on top is going to do something like, like, a, a blues the loose and, and he's going to play your songs. <laughs> Absolutely. Go ahead. <laughs> now yeah. I'm older than you, so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's great. I, you know, the thing about this kind of music is they try to pit other players against each other. Like who's better? Who's this? doesn't matter. Everybody has a lane, you know, and if you find a lane, you stick with it and there's room for everyone. You know, it's like, it's like saying, you know, I only eat chocolate cake all day, every day. It can get boring. Hmm. You know, as much as you like chocolate cake, It'll get boring. Right. So I'm chocolate cake. So you can't eat that every day. You know, so every once in a while you want a hamburger or, or spaghetti. So there's there's plenty of there's plenty of places and you know, there's plenty of, of great artists that that honestly will keep this thing going long after I'm out of it. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, Clapton, and and I think that also Clapton was also like a kind of a very important point in your life, right? When we usually stayed with him and in the Royal Albert Hall. Still is, still is. Um, he's he's you know very very influential to me, and and has been a friend for a long time, and I can't I can never repay him for what he did, you know, because he came out and he did something that turned my career around. That was the biggest. That was the biggest B twelve shot. Mm -hmm. You know, I could have ever asked for, because it meant something to me, and everybody saw that. It, it meant something. It wasn't like it wasn't like oh, what what celebrity can we get to come show up in this thing? No, I'm at the Albert Hall because I wanted to be like him, and he came. You know, that was a big that's a big fucking deal. Nice and and. Right now, yeah, you are in a point in your career that uh, now is uh, m you could play with many of the people you wanted because they would be willing to play with you, and you play with many. And I and I yeah. was thinking, is there is there anyone special that you haven't met, you haven't played, that you say, oh, I I have to play with this guy someday? No, I mean I, I've met most of my idols over the years. I never got to meet Albert King. That was a mm -hmm. was too young. Lefty. But uh, actually, I wasn't. I was active. I was actually playing. Just, we just never. I never met him. You know, I got to play with John Lee Hooker. I got to play with BB King. Got to play with you know, so many of my idols that, to be honest with you, never thought I would even get to share a stage with. Let alone call my friends. You know. And how does it change? Uh, you probably now what you're saying. You probably when you started playing, you would. Probably I never think that you would get to this point. So now you're in this point. How do you feel about it? Is you know grateful. I mean, we've taken this thing as far as further than I ever thought it would be. You know, I mean, you always hoped, but you never imagined. You know, we could sell out. You know, I just played the Hollywood Bowl twenty years ago. I couldn't draw five people in Los Angeles. So it's uh, I'm just honored. You know. And, and and right now, uh, what what do you do? You listen to, uh, music from now uh, or your new guitarists, or you you mostly keep listening to your your old idols? Or no, I I 
I, I like discovering new music. I, I just discovered a band from the Netherlands called De Wolf. I thought they were great. Yeah, you know, you know, the Pablo recorded in an album I just did with a band. He okay. recorded in one song. Yeah. Hey, I thought they were fucking great. You know, so it's like they're young kids, and they sound like a combination of the faces and focus, and yeah. and their characters, and you know, people. There's guy. There's a guy named Eddie Ninevolt who's mm -hmm. really really good. Um, he's, you know, he's going to be the future because they're, you know, part of it and, and the ones that break out have, have the one common thread is their characters, their mm -hmm. entertainers, not just players. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I dress up in a suit and sunglasses every night because that's part of the character, part of the act. And... <sighs> You know that that's a, a real important. You can't just you don't want to just stare at your shoes and play because everybody can play. It's you got to entertain, and that's a that's a big step. So I'm seeing a lot of like <clears throat> bands like The Wolf and Eddie Nine Volt. They're focused on what I think is most important is the act, the show. Mm -hmm. That's how people. That's why people want to come and see it. It's a show. It's not just great playing. Yeah, I completely agree. And and when I when I talk with with the guys of the Wolf and I saw them live, uh, a part of the show and what they do, they 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 really feel what they're doing. I mean, when when you ask them what music they they listen, they are in the sixties, seventies. They you know. Oh yeah. I watched their show and I was just laughing because I was like, I got all the references. I'm like, okay, here's a little Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. Here's a little bit of Focus, a little bit of Faces. And they're and they're killing it. They're selling the shit out of it. You know, they got two great background singers. You know, and and the drummer's a great singer. I was like, where's that? Where's this third stack coming from? There's a drummer. I was like, wow, this is this is really good. You know, great keyboards. I, I, there, I don't. There's no bass player. No, no, the keyboard plays. Uh, he, yeah, he, he plays. He plays the bass. Thought it was awesome. Yeah, that's nice. I was thinking. Uh, I, I guess you you you're gonna do like a tour to present this this album, and I yeah, wanted to we... kind of started. Yeah, huh? we already kind of started. We started playing. Okay. We started playing new tracks like in the spring. So I mean, this okay. fall will be kind of more blues deluxe centric. And you you bring horns in the band, or what? What what kind Not of? Not this fall. Uh, we're gonna do a blues deluxe tour next summer with full horn section and stuff like that but uh we're gonna keep it seven piece because we could we could do it without the horns you know i like the freedom without the horns i, I travel with the horn section for almost eight years but i like having the freedom to just not be pinned to the to the charts you know so it's a little more it's a little rough rough and ready i like that and i want to ask you about the tour uh most of my friends musicians and everyone i know with <laughs> Is willing to see you come to here to play in Spain, but I know we haven't been in a long time. We That's why, because tour. of the contracts, you know, or what? Uh, what what's, I don't know. I don't know. So, we got to come. I miss. I miss playing Spain. I love Madrid and Barcelona, and you know, we we had some wild adventures there over the years. Wow! Yeah, I, I wish you would come. That would be <laughs> so great. <laughs> Uh, I, uh, uh, before you were talking about how many uh, recordings you did, and I, I was thinking when I was preparing the interview, uh, you have done so many recordings, uh, you play so many gigs on tour, uh, and I was I wanted to know how you do so many things, and do you have a private life? I mean, how you manage everything? You know, I mean, we we did Blues Deluxe last year. We it was seven six days. The whole record took like six days. Plus the plus the day for the strings and horns, so wasn't a lot of time. Um, so that album's been in the can for over a year because I wanted to release it on the twentieth anniversary, you know, and uh, of the first one. And you know, we did our DVD last year as well, so that came out this year as well. You know, so it, we have two releases this year. Everybody thinks, well, geez, we missed work twenty four seven. Now, all that stuff was banked last year, and now just coming out. So we, we go through these kind of creative spurts where it we do a lot of work and then it, it trickles out over time. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I got two months off. Yeah. So nice. I'm, I mean, I got two months off. I'm sitting in with Glenn Hughes tonight and I have a charity gig tomorrow with Ringo Starr and Toto. 
Um, I have a another charity gig on Monday, and then I got Crossroads at the end of the month. But I mean, I think I'm playing total of ten songs in four shows, so I'm off. You know. Yeah, actually, that you you mentioned the charity. Uh, I wanted also to make a point in this interview that you you also have this keeping your blues alive fundraising project, and I would like to know how how does it work and. Well, we do those cruises every year. So that, that raises a significant amount of money for the charity. Um, we do, we do a lot of, you know, outreach. You know, we've raised over a million dollars for wow. various causes, including musicians that, that had no work during the pandemic, you know, regardless of what you think about that whole thing. But, um, the, the, You know, it's a it's a passion. I mean, we've given a lot back because I've been very fortunate. You know, oh, yeah. But Look it, at me. It, it, I, 20 years ago, I had 10 guitars to my name, no money, no gigs, no prospects. You know, now I have one of the biggest guitar collections in the world, and sitting in the Hollywood Hills. Not bad for I for kids. That's... Not, not bad for for a kid from upstate New York. You, know? you can't complain about it. <laughs> no, what do I got to fucking complain about? Nothing. <laughs> My um, worst day, yeah, honestly, your worst day is like you got to, it's all perspective. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's busy. There's shit going on every fucking day. But I'm not complaining. Yeah, actually, with, with so many guitars, because I, I have a bunch of, uh, you know, and, and I never get to play all of them. Uh, how, how many of, of the guitars you really play in a, Uh, usual basis, probably 10% of the collection, maybe 50, 50, 60, the rotating road guitars. Because you know, most of my collection is very well preserved, um, mint condition models of Fender Gibsons solid bodies that are between 1950. In 1965, that's pretty much the majority of where we're, where we're at. Um, but and I have bases. I have a lot of bases. Um, but it's not. It's not a question. You know, it's like some of this stuff is so well preserved. It's like why would you? Why would you? Why would you beat it up? You know what I mean? The stuff I play on the road has new frets. So you kind of have to have frets and, you know, get them to play right. You know what I mean? So sometimes that requires maintenance, you know, but all the road guitars are old, you know, and, and they, they fall apart. You know, it's, they're 65, 70 years old. Some of these. Mm -hmm. No. And, and collectors, I mean, those people collect stamps and they don't use it for anything, but it's just, they like to collect. It's so. like a mail letter, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you could, well, the, fifty thousand dollar stamp it'll yeah. get there uh, and and do you have i mean there's like guitarists like like bb king he had lucille and, and there's some guitarists that have like one or two guitars that are there like all day playing you don't have one or had a lot of guitars bb had a lot of guitars they, they, they were all called lucille if he was holding it it was lucille oh. okay so he i have one of his lucilles he gave it to me uh -huh. so he yeah, had a lot of guitars But, but, but I think you know, there's the, the song guitarists that they have one that is like the yeah the, well I mean for example Rory Gallagher known to play that beat up 61 strat that mm -hmm. was that was the ball game right there but he had a couple hundred guitars you yeah. see him with a melody maker you see him with telly you see him with all kinds of shit but he's known for one guitar Stevie Ray Vaughan known for one guitar but he had lots of stuff so you know generally Even guitar players that are associated with one guitar generally are closet collectors. They end up they, they, just by default. You end up with a bunch of shit, yeah. you know, yeah. over the years. And and I wanted to relate this to the tone, uh, which is like our goal always. Uh, uh, I I know. I mean, tone comes from the the guitarist, the fingers, and uh, setting up. And yeah. the like it. And I would like to know uh, for you, uh, which is the most important thing. When you get any any guitar, any amp, any pedals, what is for you your main thing to get my sound? I do this, this, and this. If you want to tell me. <laughs> well, 
it, it's the sound in your head. And generally, if you give me a, 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 a high wattage tweed fender twin and a cable, I can get there. Um, but I'll plug into a Marshall and sound exactly the same. I plug into a Dumble, I sound exactly the same. It's it's it comes from here, and it's it's just twisting the knobs. It could be a tube screamer, it could be a Klon, it could be some cheap mm -hmm. pedal. Yeah, but you just you just keep flicking the things around until until it does what you want it to do. I I I tend to use a darker sound. Um, I I. I generally gravitate to warmer, darker tones. That's why I use Gibsons a lot. Yeah. But, you know, I'll pick up a Strat or a Tele, and it's, you can use it as a weapon, you know? It's, 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 it just depends on the application in the song, you know? I play a lot of Strats because a lot of, a lot of my songs are Strat songs, you know? Um, but then sometimes you pick up a Strat for a song, you're like, it's not going to work. But even though it sounds the same, you just feel more comfortable with three three five or less Paul. That's all. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not it's not rocket science. You know, it's the longer you do it, <clears throat> the the more you realize that salvation is not in the gear. Salvation's you, you, your personal tone starts mm -hmm. with you and your hands, your heart. You know how how you hear it, mm -hmm. and you know. But the the whole the whole industry is predicated on um, the whole industry is predicated on uh, uh, the, the, the magic box no. or the magic amp B buying pedals and buying stuff <laughs> yeah it's like this this amp's gonna change your life maybe maybe not yeah, maybe actually not. I, I wanted to ask you um, most of guitarists spend their whole life looking for the the perfect sound we have in mind and many never find it so i would like to know what point of your life uh, you're you are you think you find your sound or are you still looking to it oh you're always you're always on that journey for sure you're always on that 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 quest to find oh the magic pedal or the you know it's something you know um you know i i think i, I will say my latest discovery was the early 80s super champ great amp mm -hmm. you know good recording amp good little bang around amp never gave him the second thought until i bought one from norm and i was like man these things are great you know here i am one of the by the way i'm also one of the biggest amp collectors in the world 500 wow. amps wow you know? <laughs> so it, it, you know I'm, i'm a late bloomer yeah because i was thinking Uh, Eddie Van Halen, I mean, millions of guitarists are trying to get his br famous brown sound, which, which he got in the first recordings. And he changed completely the sound in the latest years, and he kept, probably kept looking. And then you realize that most people come just to his first records to get that sound. Well, you know, you know, the trick is, you, 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 you know how they, he got it. First of all, it's on his hands. It was, like, he, he played anything to sound like Eddie Van Halen. But where most people miss the mark is they don't they they forget that his cab that they recorded all those early records at Sunset Sound was loaded with JBLs on the top and Celestians on the bottom. They would mic one of each and they would blend the JBL and they would blend the Celestian. The the JBL gave it that 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 kind of gave it the teeth mm -hmm. and the Celestian gave it the warmth and they would blend it. That's how we did it. Oh, know? nice! Plus, big old Sunset Sound plate reverb. That that was a that was a big factor. Um, but he could play anything and sound like him. You know, Clapton can play anything and sound like him. Yeah, I mean, these guys they have the sound. They're, they're and, and and the most well, all the great musicians say that the, the best thing you have to do is try to have your own voice and. And are you when you listen to your old records or your stuff? Are you do you are very do you criticize yourself a lot or or you are self indulgent or not? Or <laughs> well, no. I mean, you know, I mean, when we did the blues record last year, I brought the kit. You know, so it's like we're doing some British sound and stuff. 
So you got to bring the ancient marshal. That's what Peter Green and Clapton used and all those things. I'm not talking about the Van Halen era, the 68, 69. I'm talking about 64, 65s. JTM 45s or a blues breaker combo. That's you plug into that. You're like, okay, with a Les Paul. I'm like, that's what that's what they used. Um, you know, and then there's the fender contingent. You could blend the two and stuff like that. So, you know, I'm lucky enough to have the kit, you know, and but if I had to use one amp, it would have been fine too. You just EQ it or mic it differently. It's just more work. And and do you keep like a, a very intense practice routine? Because you, no. you are I mean, you play a lot of blues, but you also have like a great technique and you play lines, you know, very, very fast. Do you need to practice a lot to keep that, you know? No. I mean, when I'm off, I don't play much. Um, I I play a lot when I'm on the road, obviously. But I actually today I'm sitting with Glenn Hughes. So I got to, after this call, I have to warm up a little bit, play a little bit. Because um, I, I don't want to go up there cold. I haven't played in a week. Seriously, so mm -hmm. that's nice. You know, I was watching uh, the interview you did with Kenny Aronoff, uh, which, mm -hmm. which he regarded he regarded also to tracks with us with my band. And I love one of the uh, the sentences you said. You said you were talking about the past, and you said all we had was cassettes, records, and a dreams. You no, know? and I would like to know how do you think everything has changed from those days to right now with the internet and everything. Well, the information is, I mean, this is why you see a lot of young players coming out. Oh, my God, with skill sets that are insanely good. And I'm like, well, how the fuck do these kids learn all this stuff so quickly? You know, and I'm and I started thinking, I'm like, because um, they have access to the information. Like we we had records. We had liner notes. You know, we had limited amount of video. Um You know, Arlen Roth used to make those hot licks videos, and that's how I you know, studied like Danny Gatton and 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 Eric Johnson ad nauseum. Well, that's all we had. Cassettes, you used to rewind them, playback, learn. Now uh, there's tutorials online, which are great. Now, some of them, when I was playing uh uh I was recording a, a version of Riviera Paradise with Kenny Wayne Shepherd for Reese Winans record. I wanted to go through. I want to make sure I, I knew it, relearned it properly. And I go online and I'm like, most of these people are doing it wrong. So what do I do? I go, I pull up Austin City Limits, Stevie Ray Vaughan, Riviera Paradise. I'm like, that's how he's doing. So some of the information is bad, but most of it's pretty accurate. And, you know, there's definitely some advantages to that. Um, you know, but what, 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 goes away is a little bit of the mystique you know it's like well how do you think this how did how did hendrix do it or how did yeah. do it? Like, i well, don't know well you just brought to mind i remember to 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 listen the first run from some guitarists playing the vinyl from 45 rpm to revolutions to 33 so trying to slow yeah. <laughs> to hear what and, they... and generally you would find that the simplest route was what they used mm -hmm. you know um it's it's amazing you know and and i i discovered that the way chuck berry used to do those openings to like roll over beethoven um uh, uh johnny be good well everybody plays it a certain way i learned it a certain way and then i then i actually listened to it it's like no he actually does it on the the g and b string not the not the 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 g the b and the high e So I'm like, oh, well, that sounds more accurate. So it's little things that you discover over the years that help get you there. Yeah, I mean, back then was completely different, uh, and I think we all uh, we all find find a way. I remember once I read an interview from Jeff Healy, and he said that he started playing with a uh, playing guitar because he was blind and he didn't know he never saw someone play, so he just grabbed the guitar exactly. and started playing. Exactly. And by the way, he was a killer trumpet player as well. Jeff oh, Healy. yeah, I know that. That's... Yeah, I opened up for him when he was playing wow. trumpet, not guitar. I'm like, Jeff, there he is. I, I, I also wanted to ask you, you also do like a lot of uh, you know, production things and you produce like the Crown, Eric Gale record. And yeah, uh, we like to know how is this work you do like as a producer? Uh, how much time? Well, I love you... it. Yeah, I, I, I like producing other artists, you know, because and I only get involved with artists that I think I can move the needle, you know. 
you know, Josh and I do the records together and Josh is more hands-on soup to nuts kind of production. I'm, I'm, I'm the antagonizer. I, I go in and I just, I'm the first person to say, I, I don't care. Like, like, like how good we all think we are. It's like, if the song sucks, this is, this is a non-starter. So let's, let's concentrate. Let's, you know, I'm, I, I, to me, my production style is song singing, right? Whether you're Eric Gales or Joanne Shaw Taylor, it's the song, it's the singing. Mm-hmm. Everybody knows you can play. That's, yeah, yeah, he's, they're yeah. not buying the record because they, they think you're a bad guitar player. So mm-hmm. let's assume that that's on the table. So let's, let's address the weak things and try to make those stronger. So if you have a great song, a great vocal and a great solo, it's a win, mm-hmm. you know? Okay, just because we are out of the time, my, my last question would be, uh, last year I was in Berlin and I saw a concert, Beth Hart in concert, and for me it was like the most, one of the most emotional concerts I have ever been, and the way she sings is like, pff, it blew my mind, and I would like to know how does it feel, you know, playing with her, and how is that? She's great, you know, um, she's a wonderful artist, a great singer, um, great songwriter, she's, she's, she's the total package. You know, and I'm proud of the work that we did together over the last decade. And, um, you know, she still plays a lot of those songs live, which is, which is, it's a, it's a testament to the work and, and the collaboration that we did. And it's a really, it was a really good collaboration for a short period of time. And, and I'm proud of the records. Okay. Well, thank you so much. For me, it's been a great honor. I mean, you're one of my idols. So for me, it's been great. And- well, I appreciate it, man. Enjoy that guitar. I think it's cool. Yeah, I will. And, you know, hope you come to Spain and I can see you play live and hopefully interview you here in person. <laughs> Would love to. All right, man, I'll, I'll check out your song. Okay, thank you so much. Take care. Please have a good evening. Yeah, Bye. you too. Bye-bye. Bye.